Welcome to my lecture on cognition. Uh, so this is a uh, introductory lecture into what human cognition is about uh, that takes up from where Professor Sen Sheng um, introduced the topic in the first lecture of this introductory series. And um, we think it's important for you to understand something about uh, human cognition as uh, the study of human cognition and the development of artificial intelligence have a have a close interrelationship in both directions. And that will be a topic that comes up several times in both this lecture and my ne next lecture. So in fact, I want to start by citing a well-known textbook on artificial intelligence, Russell and Norvig. This is from the third edition, the fourth is out. Uh, in, in the preface of that book, the authors define what the unifying theme uh, of that field of intelligent uh, artificial intelligence is, and, and, and they say it's the idea of an intelligent agent. And, and they define artificial intelligence as the study of agents that receive percepts from the environment and perform actions. So this is um, very close to how we think about animals and humans, you know, organisms acting in the world and showing their cognitive competence um, you know, by um, performing in the world. And so I first want to um, e evoke uh, that picture. I, I want to use uh, a metaphor that was introduced by Valentino Breitenberg, who was actually a neuroanatomist. And he, he used uh, this notion of vehicles, essentially agents whose body moves the sensors through the world as the motor systems you know, generate movement. Uh, so abstractly speaking, that's a vehicle. It doesn't have wheels necessarily as an organism, but it's something where the sensors move when the motors move the body. Uh, so he used this as a, as a way to illustrate certain principles of the brain. I will not actually talk about neuroscience as much here in this lecture as that was done by Sam Sheng in the, the first lecture. Um, but I, I thought it was uh, important to uh, ground these ideas in, in sort of this larger picture. So you could, could think of these vehicles as, as models of such agents consisting of four components. So they have sensor, oops, sensors, symbolized here by these little uh, parabolas. Motors, think of these as wheels that you see from the top here. It's not really explained exactly what that are. So those would generate movement. And then there is a nervous system that connects the sensors, the output of the sensors to the motors, the input of the motors, this would be a very, very simple nervous system already just with one line on each side, ipsilateral connections. And, um, and then there's the body, it's supposed to be this rectangle here. And what the body does is it uh, makes that when the motors generate motor action, the sensors move along with the body, with the motor system, and therefore um, you know, cr create new sensory information in the world. And in fact, you can think of this as a system that's embedded in some environment. And it's, it's a very important insight of, of that line of thinking that understanding behavior and cognitive uh, competence effect more generally really uh, is based on um, some connection to the world, to the environment. And here, um, the environment has to be structured with respect to whatever these sensors are sensitive to, if they're light sensors, you know, maybe to light or to sound or whatever it is. And so there needs to be some structure in the environment. For instance, here assumed that there's some, some source of whatever that um, uh, physical quantity is, maybe a light source. And there's a distribution of intensity of that source, you know, of, of, of what that source M, uh, projects, uh, such that these uh, sensors um, receive different amounts of intensity. And uh, I want to illustrate here that a system like that can show meaningful behaviors, or in this case, orientation behavior, uh, just based on how the sensors are connected to the motors. So for instance, if these sensors translate the physical intensity into a neural activity, activation, some neural state, uh, with this negative monotonic function, so high intensity generates low activation. Um, and then the, the wheels have this monotonic increasing characteristics. So a lot of activation input into motor system creates a lot of wheel motion. Then uh, this system shows that orientation behavior very easy to understand. So the sensor that's closer to the source, let's say, gets a little higher intensity and therefore returns a little lower activation that leads to a little lower wheel motion here on the left side. 
And so if this motor turns less than that motor, then the vehicle will be rotating to the left until both sensors receive the same amount of intensity and have the same wheel motion, then it will go straight. And as it approaches the source, if the intensity is, you know, increases as you get closer to the source, it will ultimately perhaps hit you know, an intensity where zero activation is transmitted, the wheel motion will stop and it will actually you know, stay put in front of the source. There will be some orientation behavior that is actually frequently observed um, in, in a lot of animals and even in, in systems without nervous systems and simple plants even. Now, there is something in here that almost looks like cognition. This is still very simple, but if you have a sufficiently complex environment, for instance, let's say in the simple case, you would have two sources of that intensity, then the system could do something that looks like decision-making. That is, it will turn to one source rather than the other. we will really de dependent on, uh, on the gradient. So, so when the intensity decreases as a function of distance from the source, there will be perhaps one uh, source the agent is closer to, it will be sensitive to its gradient and will be attracted sort of into that source. Could think of that as you know, decision making is sort of a, a very elementary form of this, of um, cognition. We would probably not quite be willing to call it cognition yet because the decision is really entirely determined by the sensory input. It would really just depend on 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 which side uh, which side you're closer to. Let's say in terms of the the gradient of the intensity, and so there will be a unique mapping from that input to uh, the motor action and that we would not call cognition because we have a notion that in cognition, there is some, uh, some extra degree of freedom that comes between the sensing and the acting. So in uh, Professor Sancheng's lecture, uh, he made that explicit as, as cognition that's sort of between these two. And, the, and between these two really means that there is something added to it. It's not like a degree of freedom, you, you can make a decision. For instance, here, sort of like just a toy example again, uh, saying maybe there's an agent that has a more complex nervous system, not just these straight lines, some recurrent connections that could, um, for instance, turn to the green book because it has a memory of that, maintain its activity inside, and that memory is able to uh, avoid that it goes to the object, let's say the uh, sensory input that is closer and could overcome that distracting input and, and turn to, to the screen book based on memory of it perhaps, or it might have, uh, or, or, you know, you know, even, even that might entail that it has an in, inner in state it might need a concept like to know what a red a green book is like, what, what kind of sensory information um, characterize that. So it might entail recognition, for instance, will come to that. And it actually has to be able to link through such mechanisms, the concepts it has, the, the inner state it has to the current sensory input. So recognize that the green thing, the green light is the thing that it should use to um, drive its borders and not, let's say, the brown light from, from, the other, the, from that cup. Clearly, toy example, right? So, um, this, so this would you know, be perhaps like a minimal, minimally cognitive system. Um, it's actually also an interesting system because it is um, an agent where the sensory input depends on its action as a vehicle. So as it turns to the green uh, object, it will get more and more sensor information about the green object that will make it easier to steer to the green object. It might not really need to, for instance, estimate the direction in which this green book lies in order to go there. It could just do that based on maximizing the number of green pixels on the camera, let's say, uh, which would be called visual serving. So this is a form of cognition, sometimes called embodied cognition, and uh, Professor Cheng already alluded to that, in which the cognitive looking behavior evolves in close loop with the environment and is sort of very attuned to this sensory motor link. So uh, I contrast this here more abstractly, uh, where the more classical view of uh, cognition is uh, framed in the concept of information processing, which is also ultimately the uh, concept of computation, where you would have some sensory input, uh, some sensory processes, and, and ultimately some motor system that would act out in the world. And between comes the cognition, which here uh, 
uh, I call plan. The sense plan act architecture is like a, a classical artificial intelligence architecture. And so all the cognition would really be here in this planning uh, where, uh, you know, knowledge would be stored, for instance, about green objects and so on. And so, in a, in a, you know, while, while the embodiment um, situation would be one where, uh, again, there is a closed loop, the action actually influences the sensor information you get, but potentially there could also be internal loops. For instance, um, while sensing might drive your you know, cognitive processes, these cognitive processes actually will also shape how the sensory information is um, uh, analyzed. And I'll uh, be talking about that, for instance, when I talk about selective attention and visual search. And similarly, the plans may drive the motor uh, system, but the motor system could actually act back on the plans, for instance, stabilizing a plan or uh, suppressing alternative plans uh, based on uh, states of the motor system. Um, one could generally think that the, the, the more, uh, the longer the path, let's say, from the sensing to the acting, the longer, you know, the less directly the sensory inputs determine the behavior, the more cognitive is the behavior. And in a forward architecture like that, that could be easily um, formalized uh, for the number of computational steps that you would have. Um, some of you might, might uh, know uh, neural networks would maybe think, like a deep neural network, and, and the further you go from the sensory input, the, the higher you are, the more cognitive you are. If you look at these uh, embodied um, forms of cognition, it's actually a little bit less clear if one can talk like that, right? Uh, because um, there's no clear directionality here. Um, it's an interesting topic, how to actually characterize that. And one way to talk about it is to talk about um, a, a form of invariance that some of the qualities of behavior that we consider to be cognitive uh, would then not actually depend on the sensory motor details. For instance, um, you would be able to recognize that book even if it's green is exactly the green you remember or its shape is a little bit different or as it ch changes in appearance as you approach it, you invariantly under those changes always recognize it as a book and direct your action at it. And similarly, you know, the motor behavior you have to show uh, would uh, be variable depending on where you're coming from or if the obstacles and so on. But um, the invariant part of it is that you achieve to have the book right in front of you, let's say, this very simple example. So uh, Professor Sanchen talked about intelligence and actually you discussed that a little bit. And um, I, I not talked about cognition. There's some kind of notion that you know, cognition is you know, where the intelligence comes from or is sort of the, pro the cognitive processes are those that make intelligent. Uh, as you already saw in that previous lecture, I, I believe you, you discussed that in, in work groups. It's uh, not a terribly clear concept what intelligence really is. In biology, actually, people often talk about intelligent um, solutions or you know, animal intelligence of just as in the sense that um, these behaviors that are efficient toward a goal you now for the purpose of achieving something are adequate uh, in a, a certain branch that I'll refer to later. Um, people talk about rational behavior as something that optimizes some utility function, for instance, and that's supposed to be an operationalization of intelligence. Um, and, and, you know, very often people think about intelligent as uh, being about problem solving, creativity, maybe discovering analogy, some, some new things. And so it's, it's not uh, as easily defined. And I will actually not be talking about in, in, in that language a lot. I will be really talking about the cognitive processes. And you will be seeing that the processes the forms of cognition that are most commonly linked to intelligence are actually uh, relatively special and, and advanced forms and that there's a lot of very down to earth kind of uh, cognition that are a prerequisite to achieve that, that form of cognition. And so actually for the rest of this lecture, I will be trying to drive the point home that human cognition is quite specific. It has specific function. It has specific structure as, in terms of processes. Um, so it's actually not general purpose computational kind of intelligence. And in fact, these specific functions and structures have to do with the um, evolutionary origin in organisms with the need uh, to 
perceive the environment through sensors and to act on the environment through motor systems. And they're not actually so close to the kinds of tasks we often think of as, as being signs of intelligence in, in computing, like uh, you know, the way the computers actually do compute or do uh, arithmetic or even do logic and, and search in large amounts of data and optimize complex functions and so on. Those are actually not things that humans are necessarily good at, by the way. Uh, even your laptop computer uh, is, beats you in most of these tasks. Um, and so for you to get a sense for that, I really want to take you through concrete cognitive functions, sort of the main chapters of a textbook on cognitive psychology. I'll not go very deep, but I'll, I'll give you a panorama of these kinds of behaviors, and then we want to see some of the problems that are in there. And some of these problems are actually also called problems of artificial intelligence, it turns out, if you take that intelligent agent view of artificial intelligence. So here's a survey of what I will be talking about. I will be talking quite a bit about visual cognition, uh, memory, decision-making, thinking, acting, language, and motivation. I will be uh, being become uh, the most profound or most most detailed about these first couple of topics, and then only uh, somewhat cursory, cursorily uh, discuss uh, language and motivation, for instance. So let's uh, let's start with visual cognition. Right? Visual cognition is about perception, and here's just a photo that I want you to briefly look at and you know wonder what did you see. And of course, not very difficult. You saw people in a lab, right, working on computers and stuff like that. So here's again that picture. And I'm pretty sure that you didn't really think so much about the visual appearance. Let's say there is a bit dark spot here and there's a lot of brightness here. Yes, you noticed that, but um, you very much noticed the things that are there, right? So the important point that uh, perception is actually about seeing the world not seeing the stimulus per se. Uh, you, you are uh, essentially in perception you make inferences about what in the world caused the stimulus more so than a description of the stimulus. You can actually look at a picture like the one we're just looking at as a picture if you, if you're, so if I put this up and I ask you, you know, look at the shading patterns up here and, and look at, at here the shading and maybe uh, you know, the, the, the look at, at uh, here another form of shading for instance or the perspective uh, transformation. Like if you want to paint this uh, cup, then you might want to look at how it visually appears. But when you uh, look at this in the ordinary way, then you will be looking, seeing an object here and how it visually appears is sort of secondary. Um, so when you look around as you just did, uh, sometimes called visual exploration, you perceive um, something about the world and retain uh, from perception something about the world, but it's actually not everything that is visible in the scene. So that's something that depends on what you did, what how you visually explore it. And I have a little demo of that that uh, runs at the label of change blindness. Just look at that. So I don't know if you noticed the image was um, briefly turned off and then was turned on again. And between those two presentations, uh, something major changed in the image. I don't know if any, anyone noticed by chance, somebody might have noticed, many of you might not have noticed that. And um, the, the reason why you didn't notice it is that uh, two things. First of all, if, if I were to suddenly make a piece of this image disappear, like this little boy on the right, if I were to suddenly make that uh, boy disappear from the image, and maybe you know, fill in the background, then you would notice that because you would see that transient, that change in the image. And the image was turned off and on to prevent that. When, you, when I turn it off, then there's a transient everywhere in the image and I turn it on again, right? So, so the transient is no longer informative about where in the image there is change. So if I, if I get rid of that simple uh, change detection mechanism, then the only way you can detect the change is by comparing what you saw previously to what you saw later. And in this case, many of you will not have noticed what, what it was because you didn't pay attention to that particular object. So here I'll show you the version where I eliminate the gap. In fact, you will immediately see what happened, right? You saw that there was this object here, uh, some box that was here and that disappeared, right? And here, now you detect that immediately because I, I allow the visual transients to guide you to that location. You're attending to that location and seeing it. So if you didn't happen to look there, 
then you did not notice um, that change. And that sort of illustrates that we're not perceiving everything that's in the scene. Um, we only perceive, roughly speaking, objects that we attend to. Attend to can mean, in practice, often look at it, but in terms of shifting your gaze, but also um, some psychological process called selective, uh, selective attention that helps uh, you bring an object into, into the foreground and, and store it, for instance, in, in working memory. And if, so, uh, yes, you know, similarly here, um, the, when I said you, you remember some things, that's because in visual expression, you attend to some things. You tend to um, be attracted to uh, human faces, for instance, that's a natural property of us. And uh, now, for instance, I know some of these people and I will be, be very much uh, register and look at the people I know and then remember who was in that scene. Um, you can also um, have, have a goal, a task. You, know, you, you might have the goal of uh, finding the robot. There's actually a robot in that classroom, as some of you might have noticed. And uh, here it is, right? Um, I, I, I think this is pretty salient. So many of you might have noticed it before, even though it's a bit it's a funny looking robot. And so you, you, you know, very often the, what you uh, register in the scene depends on your task, on your goal. It's not just exploratory. You will have some purpose. For instance, when you act, you would uh, look in, uh, at objects that are useful for that action. For instance, the object you want to direct the action at, maybe a tool that you want to use, uh, or you know, in social interaction, the person that you're interacting with, and so on. Um, and the, the, these two qualities, the, the, the latter is called visual search when you're um, selecting an object for attention based on some goal, some task. And the, the, what is engaged here is attention selection and attention is what you uh, control when you visually explore by looking at different locations. Um, you, you will be easy, easily recognize that this is a different angle of the same scene. You might even recognize some of the people. And certainly that up there is, again, this robot arm now from a different perspective. And what you were doing here is some form of recognition. Uh, you recognize that as being the same sort of identity. Previously, you recognized it as an object, as a category. Uh, you might be able to estimate its pose, its shape, segmented from the background. You could extract features like, no, it's an orange thing that could really help you to find it in a, in a next complicated scene. So these are examples of processes of visual cognition. There's a lot of work on that, on endowing um, artificial intelligence systems with such visual cognition. You will be hearing about that in this introductory course in the machine learning part, for instance, that tries to emulate some of these functions uh, with some success, but actually with still a still major bottleneck. And for a very long time, it was a bottleneck to emulate this very fundamental form of human cognition that we do so automatically and, and so well that we often don't even realize that we do it. So that's all I want to say about uh, visual cognition. Uh, now you will uh, see that it overlaps with memory. And the first thing to recognize when you think about memory uh, is that visual cognition entails memory. So memory is uh, any kind of cognitive state that influences your you know, conscious perception, but also perhaps your actions and your future thought uh, that does not rely on the presence of the stimulus. So after the stimulus has been removed, uh, you still have that state. And now it's a very simple form of definition. And uh, it is actually entailed in visual perception in the sense that you are visually uh, performing these so-called visual, visual saccades. Uh, so saccadic eye movements are these abrupt eye movements that you make all the time. You can only see that in someone else's eye. Your own eye is actually not sensitive during the rapid movements, only picking up the image in the different fixations. Here are some um, fixation locations uh, tra traced by observing the, the uh, gaze of an observer that looks at that photograph. And you see they, this person does tend to look a lot at the people and at some objects on the table and not so much here on the unstructured background here. Um, so you, imagine whenever you do that on your retina, there is this particular uh, image that's centered you know, on, on the fixation location. So if you look around like that, the image is radically shifting around. So in a way that is not really very uh, 
consistent with your visual impression of the world. You make a saccade like that every 300 milliseconds, three per second, so you know, thousands and thousands of saccades over a day. And, and therefore your visual uh, stimulus is actually a wild blur of these different uh, images that you have all the time. Uh, it's just sort of like when you take a camera and move it around, you know, see it's very, very uh, shifty and very difficult to see anything. And that's certainly not um, the, how you perceive the world. You perceive the world as being out there resting, maybe uh, more, transforming a little bit if you slightly shift your body, but it's, it's basically stable, but that's not actually the stimulus. And it turns out that that impression of the world is actually largely memory. It's called visual working memory is the first part of it, but about it, um, you actually have a quite limited capacity for it. So remember about four or five objects. And when I say objects, I mean locations with some properties at these locations, like certain feature values, colors and shapes and things like that. And, um, and not much more. It's surprising, you might be shocked to know that. Um, it's, it's work memory in the sense it's, uh, there's interference. It is if you, if you then look at the next item, then you forget some of the earlier items. That is, you cannot answer questions about their visual appearance, for instance. That's, um, so that, that is well studied. Uh, it, on the other hand, you also do build a longer term memory of a scene uh, and also are very good at them, very quick. Uh, here's uh, some data from uh, a colleague of mine, Andrew Hollyworth uh, at the University of Iowa, uh, who, uh, uh, who uh, asked people to look at these kind of naturalistic scenes, stimuli like that. And he directed their attention by putting a little circle or sort of like a, a flashlight onto particular objects. Uh, so this way motivated people to look for 10 seconds at one object each and then for, for 10 objects in each scene. And it, he did that for 40 scenes. And right? so that will be a total of 400 objects that were looked at. And then a month later, he brought people back into the lab and asked them, you know, did this pin, was it like this or like that? Was this knife, did it have this um, a handle or that handle? And you know, the Coke the bottle was like this. So that, there were also some questions where the identity of the object had changed. This is an example where the, uh, you know, the, the shape, the, the, the appearance of the object had changed. And people had 95% retention after a single 10 second look. And they uh, somewhat effortlessly. Um, so people are very good at that. That's something that we, uh, we do all the time. That's what we're tuned to, to uh, register our visual environments. It's important that these scenes are naturalistic, that they tap into semantic knowledge get to that later. So you wouldn't be able to retain as much information about just some arbitrary uh, you know, rectangles and little squares or you know, little things like that, um, as sometimes used in psychology experiments. In fact, we're not good at rote learning. Right? Rote learning would be things like a word, arbitrary word lists that are very often used in the laboratory to study memory uh, and that play a role in some school forms of learning. There, you, if you do something like that with an arbitrary word list, uh, maybe like vocabulary type, uh, you would have retention rates from a single, single study of uh, a few percent. So this taps into a part of our machinery, our cognitive machinery that's very strong. The, the uh, closely related form of memory is called episodic memory. And I believe that uh, Professor Sheng uh, talked about that. He, discussed, or uh, at least in the exercise, you discussed this famous amnesic uh, patient who was no longer able to build episodic memories. So episodic memories are uh, memories from single exposure that you form about things you experienced, about you know, the perceptual appearance of things and sequences of actions and maybe decisions and so on. They are not laid down like a tape recorder uh, for the whole day, even though there are some exceptional individuals who do have very detailed um, episodic memory of almost everything they experience, but most of us um, have only certain highlights that are modulated by emotions. Uh, they also get modified when we remember, when we recall, then every time it's changed a little bit. And this exists on all kinds of time scales. So uh, ultimately autobiographic memory that very much defines your identity, who you are is sort of built up over the long run from um, this ensemble of your memories. Uh, a slightly different form of still declarative memory is 
what is called semantic memory. It's a little bit harder to, to capture in the laboratory experiments, try to do that. Uh, it's sort of the meaning of things. So for instance, you know about kitchens, you know, the sort of things that are in kitchens where that there would be a sink, what it is good for, what the faucet uh, does, you know, what that the stove is for heating and so on. You know about, uh, you know, the visual appearance of things, the variation of things and so on. So generally semantic memory that is built over many exposures, not, not just uh, a single exposure, uh, builds knowledge, knowledge about the world. It's not just visual knowledge about how things work, um, about links between things and so on. It's uh, famously difficult to capture in artificial intelligence systems. It's been uh, one of the big problems of getting that sort of knowledge. Sometimes that's called background knowledge, how get, to get that kind of knowledge into AI systems. And uh, I'm uh, mentioning here, especially these very simple daily life kinds of knowledge, which are particularly hard to capture like that. I mean, there's also some motor knowledge like that. You know, how hard do you have to pull on a Coca-Cola can pin, uh, you know, so that it doesn't break? That is something that you know from experience and you have a concept for that. And, uh, you know, how uh, do, you, you know, do you have to pay attention when you open the tap that it doesn't uh, you know, splutter? Uh, maybe you want to open it slowly. That's, that's knowledge. You have this uh, knowledge that you uh, maybe wouldn't articulate, but you, you show it in your actions. So these things are, uh, these two forms of memory often called declarative uh, in that you can represent them explicitly, talk about them. Uh, it's actually uh, in, in the case of semantic knowledge, there is some real continuum into what I'll talk about next uh, procedural uh, memory. Um, and I already mentioned that it's a major problem in AI. There will be a lecture by Professor Acosta, Maribel Acosta, who will talk about uh, knowledge systems, but in a much more abstract way. And uh, most progress on knowledge and artificial intelligence systems has really come from, um, from much more abstract domains, like acquiring uh, knowledge about you know, medicine or about um, banking systems and things like that, where there is less of this linkage to perception. Now, procedural memory is, is the other part. You, you did hear, I believe, in this exercise with uh, Professor Sancheng, that um, uh, procedural uh, memory, that you know, an amnesiac uh, patient who cannot build new episodic memory was actually able to learn to play the piano, or I don't know which example was shown to you, um, which is a procedural form of memory. It's actually a skill that you acquire over a lot of practice. And that's, you know, that example shows it's really a different um, thing in that sense. It, it, it has different neural substrate, but it can also be characterized through different kinds of parameters. Um, and you have these sort of skills in all domains. I mean, the children need to learn to walk and it really matters if they can practice or not. If they uh, have less opportunity to practice, it will take them longer. Uh, in some very, you know, some very protective cultures, then kids are um, somewhat delayed in their motor development. You, you also know that uh, uh, children need to learn the language. It takes uh, many years to, to learn language. In fact, even as a teenager, you're still developing uh, language skills. Reading to, and writing learns, uh, takes a very long time. Um, and of course, arithmetic, mathematics, ultimately you are learning here at the university uh, skills that are still new to you. So it's interesting perhaps to realize that this procedural memory and the skills are um, you know, based on experience and they take a lot of practice, a lot of different varied experiences. Uh, so the way that knowledge exists in, in this form is not something that you can download. You, know, you can take a pill to sort of store it. And you may, might really sense that there is a real difference here between this form of knowledge and the kind of knowledge that you would really be uh, able to explicitly represent. It's one of the frontiers of modern um, artificial intelligence to, and actually of, of theories and cognition to understand how that works. Uh, so even though you will be learning about machine learning and you know that there's enormous progress in machine learning. Uh, most of that does not come anywhere near what humans do when they learn from experience. Uh, we sometimes call that autonomous learning because it's, uh, you know, it, it, it isn't taught in some special regime. It is actually emerges just as you act and think and, and experience. 
<laughs> Good. So, so much about memory. Now, decision making is often sort of viewed as sort of the core element of uh, cognition. I already hinted in the introduction that it's about you know, when you decide that sort of the minimal uh, case where it's no longer uniquely determined by the input, what your behavior, what your output is going to be. That will be a decision point in a sense. Um, we make decisions every moment in time, right? Uh, I already hinted that you were making a saccade every 300 milliseconds, so you're deciding where to look every 300 milliseconds, right? That's a decision, it's a selection decision. And similarly, in our motor behavior, we're selecting which object to tend to, which action or movement to make. Uh, now that I'm lecturing, I'm deciding what to say next, in, both in terms of you know, the words, the sentences, the topic, you know, uh, maybe the tone and so on, and, and thinking, you know, you're, 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 you have to come up with the next thought uh, among all the possible thoughts. And there's very often this notion that these are selection decisions in the sense there might be a range of possible um, states to go to. Not all states would be accessible. That would be, for instance, the stimulus, the per percept would give you some opportunities for what to look at or what to attend to and not others. Um, but it could be a very large uh, space, for instance, the kinds of things that I can think of would be a very large space and I have to make decisions uh, within that. So that happens on all time scales. It happens um, you know, from 100 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds, as I was hinting, but also, of course, from minute to minute and from, from hour to hour and day to day and ultimately over life. You make decisions whom to marry or, or you know, to have children, things like that. Um, this is an area where there is uh, detailed neuroscience uh, work on the short time scale of how you make sensory motor decisions in particular. Here's an example, uh, well-known uh, example of uh, monkeys, for instance, making a decision by moving their gaze to one of two response buttons. And the decision they have to make is about some visual display that has motion, but it's not very unique. Different points move in different directions. They have to decide which, in which direction most, most of these points are moving and uh, make a saccade in that direction and they are rewarded if they did that right and they learn that task. You can then uh, record from neurons, this is for instance in IT, infotemporal, uh, so, so the high uh, perceptual area where you see that these neurons change their firing, for instance, those neurons that are responsible for the response uh, in one direction, the, the, the direction currently asked here, will increase their firing and the other ones will also increase their firing initially and then decrease their firing. Responsible form, meaning in the sense if you, if you observe under which conditions these neurons fire, they, let's say they con, uh, fire under conditions where movement to the right is seen or movement to the le left is seen, you can establish that and then study them in this task. So you could sort of see that here the decision uh, arises that is here the neurons either keep firing or they are inhibited depending on which outcome it is or you could conversely say the outcome determines which way they're firing and this is uh, the sort of thing that, that some of us uh, really model with neural methods actually my, my lab works very much uh, connected to these sorts of questions for instance uh, these kind of uh, we call these dynamical fields are particular representations of neural networks that account for such cognitive process for decision making if you go to this web page you get can get some information about that. I'm not going to go into this level here. Just a little pointer that that's a direction in which sort of the most elementary forms of cognition can be studied with neural models. Now, uh, the the other direction about decision making that you will be uh, that that is maybe more prevalent to what uh, artificial intelligence is about is really about the contents. What kind of decisions you make and. You can look at that in, in, you know, again in very different scales. There's a big experimental program that uh, is sometimes called behavioral economics. And in fact, uh, uh, these famous psychologists got the Nobel Prize for economics for their contributions because the, this radiates into um, modeling human beings as members of the economy, of making decisions of what to buy and, and how to behave. Uh, so that's about you know, how how rational that is, that is, are you really maximizing utility, how using information about that, how does it depend on time too, but it's a larger time scale, for instance, spontaneous buying decisions versus ones that you think over more and so on. So there's a lot of interesting uh, going on in this direction and, and it's actually an area that's becoming much more mainstream than it was for many years. Uh, 
So I'll not to go more deeply into that. Uh, I just want you to be aware of it as a field. Um, now, now let's move up. So moving up sort of from sensing motor to more, you know, more, more uh, traditionally thought of uniquely um, human uh, thinking kind of cognition, right? More abstract cognition, so thinking and acting. Now, let's first realize that uh, in, you know, just achieving something in the world is already some form of problem solving. That is, you're, you're, almost everything that you do in the world consists of many steps, many uh, sequences of individual acts and movements. You know, if you make coffee, let's say in a classic coffee maker, you have to maybe even at first find the coffee and go, go there and open the door and get the coffee, um, coffee container, maybe open its lid and you know, all these different steps. Um, or you fix your bike, which might be something that you do less often and maybe is really truly some form of problem solving if the sequence isn't fixed. Um, so if you look at the microstructure of these sequences, they are in close interaction with the world. You, know, you, you need to find objects in the world, both by physically going there, but also by maybe uncovering them, if you open the cupboard and then directing your attention to them, ultimately grasping them and so on. And then you also act on them. So that is, is essentially a form of intelligent action, namely achieving goals in the world that uh, you could, could think um, is, is the acting out form of thinking or as a close alliance with thinking. Um, some of these sequences can be fairly automatic and, and not really require a lot of mental effort. For instance, you, uh, driving is like that. And you would uh, you know, manipulate like the, the shift or I don't know, the, maybe the direction light or even drive home without thinking much and, and suddenly you're home because it's a fixed automatic sequence, a habit. Uh, in other cases, you uh, might really uh, make an effort to find the sequence. For instance, if you uh, do something like organize, uh, write a doctor thesis or you organize a trip to Paris, I'm just taking this as an example where you might have to think, well, how do I do that? Go by train or uh, go by plane or, you know, or not go at all as we are now under lock lockdown. Um, so there, there's a continuum between um, how cognitive that then appears. But even these automatic sequences are uh, flexible, react to the environment, and, and so on. So you can think of, um, uh, of, of thinking as being uh, a disembodied form of that. That is, if you, you know, if you do mental arithmetic or you do um, you know, think through a task and so on, you're, you're doing something like mental acting. It's, you don't have to act it out. I'll have an example a little later about mental mapping example of that um, and, and that is really closer to what is uh, a, a core topic in artificial intelligence uh, there will be a lecture by professor Glasmachers about planning just a classic planning algorithm how humans do that is actually not uh, as well known there's much more knowledge about decision making memory um, and all the sensory motor things than um, than about um, planning and, and, and problem solving. Very qualitative kind of things are known, for instance, that we tend to make hypotheses and stick to them longer than is rational, little things like that, but it's, it's not so well understood, interesting. Um, the, the way we do these more mental examples, uh, but also actually a lot of the examples already mentioned, um, is based on abstractions. This actually comes out of visual cognition, but it can, you know, it doesn't, isn't li limited to vision, um, abstractions of percepts or uh, actions that we call concepts. And uh, concepts can be relational, for instance, you know, richer than, larger than would be done, but also moving to or you know, hitting. So verbs sort of set up relations between something, sometimes more complex functions. Uh, and ultimately propositions, namely being able to say that something is true or not, for instance. Um, and that's a big topic of uh, cognitive psychology to understand the nature of that. It uh, turns out there is a lot of complexity in data. There are probably multiple different kinds of concepts, concepts that are based on prototypes. Uh, so for instance, um, people study uh, things like, like whether you consider a chair to be a typical piece of furniture while a curtain is not a typical piece of furniture. That 
for instance, turns out to be reliably how people think of it. And they might have, for instance, a longer reaction time when you uh, force them to classify it as a piece of furniture. Um, and that would have to do with um, how much overlap, for instance, that concept has with other categories. There's also a, a different form of representation where exemplars are, um, with categories are, are based on exemplars. So, so exemplars within a category that you have seen would be more easily classified than um, exemplars that, that are new. Uh, which is not when it's prototype based because the prototype could be uh, so an idealized case that you never saw in that form, but that is a good average representative. And there are other kinds of um, concepts that are not going too much. So uh, people study this a lot. For instance, they um, have you know, interesting things like, like um, for instance, birds have feathers and can fly would be something you might tend to say, and that would be true for a typical bird, but then penguins are also birds and they don't have either. So uh, there's a lot of structure in, in that domain uh, that is being studied. Um, and the way that is done in uh, studied in artificial systems is actually not very overlapping, even though there is now increasing interest in the relationship between, uh, for instance, machine learning, uh, uh, representations that are derived from machine learning and human cognition. And so uh, when, when you have concepts, then uh, you have access to really mental operations, so inference, reasoning, and so on. Uh, a lot of these are based on analogies, on establishing what is called structure ma mapping, establishing relationships between different things. That's why you need these concepts to do that. So here, for instance, you, this is uh, one example from an intelligence test, Raven's uh, progressive matrix test where you discover some regularities from the see the number of item increases for these gray ones and then for the shapes to see that they're, they're all different. And then you see that there is some, something systematically changed here, the orientation a little bit different. And then you are able maybe to say which of these here at the bottom you fill in here. So what you're using here is the capacity to uh, find analogies between, you know, how the relationship between these and, uh, is consistent with the relationship between these two and so on. And that will be sort of a, a, a part of something that we would consider now really thinking. That will be mental operations and so on. So there's a, a lot of study actually about that, especially here, these, these two topics. I'm also actually in my own work interested in that. The uh, lecture Professor Strasser will give on, on logic is sort of deeper down, they really tells you what propositions are and so on. And, and um, the human psychology then has to do with how, to which extent we actually realize such logic. And there are actually uh, interesting deviations from the mathematical logic that, that, that humans use. Finally, uh, a little bit about language. Um, that's of course the human competence, right? We are the language animal, we are the communicating animal, and we are um, the animal that really is very willing to share information. It's very, very important for us. Uh, we are, the, that makes us special as a species. Tomasello is a famous psychologist who, who has um, argued very strongly that, uh, that the willingness to communicate makes us different. If you look at um, other uh, primates, um, there's a critical point there. They can communicate when they need to, but uh, they will not uh, do that for its own sake, just voluntarily. So it's, it's really very human, a uh, very human characteristic. It's not just about thinking, as for instance, uh, Noam Chomsky sometimes argues. It's really about communication. I wanted, to, it's a huge topic. I was just going to give you a little bit of a flavor of that. So, so one thing is that, that um, language communication, but even just, you know, the concepts yourself you have in your mind, uh, only, uh, you know, in humans always um, can establish again that link to the world outside through perception. Uh, in both directions, you, that is perceptual grounding, which I'm illustrating here, but also in the sense of being able to see something and describe it, so generate language to be about the world. So for instance, uh, when I say red cups, you can easily hear in this image, know what I'm talking about, that I'm talking about these two cups, for instance. Or more subtle, if I say the red cup to the left of the green cup, you know, that's already actually quite a subtle thing, right? Because there are two red cups, 
and the two green cups. Uh, now this green cup doesn't have anything on the left of it. So it must be that cup that I'm referring to that has uh, something on the left of it. You can see how cognitive that is because I'm actually, I need to exclude certain possibilities by testing hypotheses, rejecting them, and then arriving at, at the answer. And the answer is what we call perceptual grounding. That is, we're able to know what the, that phrase refers to, what, what my communication partner, let's say, is talking about. Um, yeah. Uh, so that's a very general idea about language, that uh, in language, it's a relationship is established between concepts for which we have words, we have ultimately, you know, phonological representations like fork, and we link it to perceptual experience like the visual surface of those. Here from uh, Jake and Duff's book, uh, um, characterization of the perceptual path that leads to something he calls uh, conceptual structure and, and sort of the, the, the word part and the linking of these two is uh, this grounding process that I was just illustrating or the generation, you know, the, the, pro the process of then saying fork when I see a fork. That's not a trivial problem. Um, it's often, very often not unique, but much more often than you might think. Um, and here I can take an example again from Jacob Duff's book, uh, put the apple on the towel and then put the apple on the towel in the cup. And you see that the first part of the sentence is the same, but has very different meaning. Right? It refers to the apple that's on the towel. So the apple on the towel here, that is uh, in the, uh, you use that relation being on the towel to specify which of the two apples you put in the cup. So they put, they put in the cup, that's the other relation, a movement relation. Well, here, the uh, put the apple on the cup is a unique apple and the put in the cup is a movement relation. Uh, put, put on the towel is a movement. Uh, relation. So these are ambiguous, um, here in this case it's an ambiguous phrase, and you are disambiguating it based in part here on the uh, on the context. Uh, to resolve the second part of the phrase, you only one variant of the first part of the phrase is um, uh, meaningful. And uh, it's an example of uh, an interaction between meaning here, you could actually do that even if you just um, Im image it, you don't actually need the, the person to just be good that necessarily, but uh, you very often use the perception of the world and world knowledge about you know, properties of the world uh, to make sense of sense like that, just disambiguate it. So it's very tightly coupled to perception and, and uh, world knowledge. So the more general idea is that there would be different sources of perception. So we've always talked about vision, but you can also talk about uh, you know, here, uh, haptic input, proprioceptive input, you know, about your body, or then auditory input to, um, to hear, to have the sounds that you're aware of. And in fact, ten, generally your perceptual experience about, is about, about these things, how, you, how things sound and, and look and, and feel and so on. But the, the, what you extract in visual cognition or in, in cognition is you know, about the objects in the world and their relationships and so on. So the meaning, that's what I said earlier about uh, perceptual structure, there will be um, something at this conceptual level that you extract from that, seeing the objects in the world and then knowing what our objects in the world the uh, phrase uh, refers to. Um, so this can, is true even when you're not um, really perceiving. You, you, you could uh, just take a couple of propositions. This is from a paper by Ragni and Knauf here from Gießen University, um, where you could take a couple of uh, propositions like the Ferrari is parked to the left of the Porsche and the Volkswagen is parked to the right of the Porsche and the Volkswagen is parked to the left of the Opel and the Opel is parked to the left of the BMW. I hope I got that right. I replaced the brand names. And then you can answer a question like, is the Porsche parked to the left of the BMW? Which I think is true if I had the patience to think through it. And so this is an example of mental mapping and, and then mental inference. And what I'm saying is essentially that the, there's a close analogy between how you do that and how you and do this when you're actually looking at that parking lot. 
uh, in, in other words, you're creating a mental map. It's a, a map that doesn't depend on essentially the detailed uh, visual experience. You don't have to imagine the portrait to be black or, you know, the, the, you, you can put the concepts into a mental map and then make inferences on that mental map. And that's how you give meaning to a phrase, to, to a uh, sequence of phrases like that. There's also, of course, the speech part, which is uh, which generates that conceptual structure from uh, from speech, so you, where you ultimately have to process the speech input, make a phonological analysis that interacts with the syntactic analysis, and that ultimately semantic analysis. And I'm not going to go into that. That's a whole, of course, very large field that is sometimes called um, uh, cognitive linguistics or psycho. Uh, psychology of language. The last lecture in this introduction by Professor Kolesak touches on some aspects of that, more from an engineering and, uh, you know, again, a artificial intelligence point of view, how you can emulate some of these functions in technical systems. The last point I want to make in this survey over human uh, properties of, percept uh, of cognition is to talk about motivation. It's, it's a, in a way, it's sort of a, like an old fashioned topic in some sense. Uh, it, it used to be much more prominent uh, in Germany. We had some famous motivational psychologists and has uh, taken a little bit of a backseat in the last years. It, it was thought of being central to us as humans, as uh, the will, you know, to have will, to, to have willful volitional action toward goals and have values to decide what to do. That, that was a very important topic. It still is to some extent, there is um, some work on what is called cognitive control on staying on task and the, what happens when you switch tasks, for instance. And then there's work on, especially neuroscience kind of work on how we ward reinforcers uh, act and emotions modulate uh, for instance, memory, uh, modulate goal achievement, and so on. Uh, I think Professor Zhencheng alluded to the role of the frontal brain, the famous ca case of uh, Phineas Gage, who had a major frontal uh, brain lesion and was no longer really able to control himself in a sense. Uh, that, that has to do with motivations. It's a little, it's, it's, um, um, I, I would say it's it's not as fully developed as other parts of cognitive science. I, I believe that that is an important, uh, fascinating frontier. Uh, ultimately, we derive uh, our sense of meaning and sense of purpose and identity a lot from that, from the things that drive us, that, you know, that we're trying to achieve from our goals. Uh, it's also probably what most artificial intelligence systems are missing. They, so it's always a bit odd to me when people talk about robots uh, taking power, but they don't have any will to power, if you wish, because uh, they don't really have any structure at that level. And it's uh, something I, I think people might want to think more about. There's a famous book by Jordan Peterson, who's popular for other reasons in the internet. He wrote a book in 1999, Maps of Meaning, that actually has to do with with that level and, and looking at how exploration, curiosity, uh, driving, you know, uh, reacting to, to, to novelty with either fear or curiosity and how you manage that. And there's a lot of uh, knowledge about that, but it's not um, all already uh, scientifically accessible. So there, there's some need for more work in that direction. Okay, so that was my survey. There is, of course, more. If you go to the textbook of condition, there's more. It's a very diverse field as well. And so I, I hope that it became clear that what human cognition is has is quite has specific structure, right? There is uh, specific things that we do well. With, through culture, we're able to leverage these to more abstract domains. But the core of it is very much vision, spatial action, spatial. I didn't talk much about motor behavior. I'll have another introductory lecture into robotics in uh, two or three weeks. And I will use that opportunity to talk more about uh, the movement itself. There's also a lot of cognition in movement, actually. Um, so that was short left a little bit. Now, uh, last one I want to make do is, is um, compare this to the goals of AI. I, I, I flash the uh, table of contents of that textbook. Here, this is this Russell Norvig textbook. Um, to, to show you what kind of topics are part of artificial intelligence. And, you know, here's this uh, definition through intelligent agents. 
But then, for instance, the first chapter is about problem solving, and it's really using the concept of search, search algorithms. No, not very much what I talked about as human cognition and uh, constraint satisfaction. Uh, then there's uh, something about reasoning knowledge, yes, but uh, about uh, first order logic, inference, first order logic, classical planning. Um, knowledge representations and so on. It's a little overlap with what I talked about, right? Concepts and so on. There's a lot about um, probability, so how to represent uncertainty, Bayes' rule, probabilistic reasoning. Um, Decision-making is actually largely, uh, essentially decision, so-called uh, statistical decision theory, so probabilistic ways of looking at that. Um, and maybe, the, yeah. There's some overlap here with, with things that are done in humans. Uh, learning is, of course, machine learning is learning from examples. Uh, you will learn a lot about that in the, cor in, in the course. Uh, learning probability, probability distributions, reinforcement learning. There's a little bit of overlap here with what I hinted at, that uh, reward modulates behavior and so on. Uh, it's actually not very much. Classically, reinforcement learning was viewed as anti-cognition. I'll talk about that a little bit in the other lecture about theoretical frameworks, uh, history of thought. And then there's language. There's a little bit of overlap in natural language processing. Uh, and then you see here there's perception. Uh, robotics would be sort of the motor part and some conclusions. So you could say the core themes of AI overlap only to a limited extent with human cognition, right? Uh, perception, action, memory are sort of are not central in AI. They are sort of um, add-ons or applications almost of AI. So the core themes of human cognition, which are very much these groundings of all cognition and sensing motor, are not so core in AI. And so there's an interesting relationship. It, it, these two are somewhat aligned, but they're not perfectly aligned and, and they have been diverting. And that is actually something I want to emphasize in the other lecture that I'll have a separate video on. Uh, when you look at the history of thought, I mean, how do we theorize about cognition? How do you think about cognition? Then you will see that same dance between theories of human cognition and artificial intelligence that are not perfectly aligned, but they are interacting a lot and, and uh, dependent, mutually dependent. So that's my first uh, brief overview. And for that topic, go to the second video.